We're blessed today to have Reverend Ron Litton, former pastor at Fort Hill, to share our message. Good morning. I want to read to you this morning from first Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 2, where the prophet declares to us, he was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures, but it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. We took the punishment and that made us whole. Through the bruises, we got healed. We're all like sheep who wandered off and gotten lost. We're all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. On him. He was beaten. He was tortured. But he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was let off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he'd never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still, it's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain, the pain that, that he gave himself as an offering for sin, so that he'd see light come from it, life, life and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones. And he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death on the face and didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest, he took on his own shoulders the sin of many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. And from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, we hear this story. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came up to him. Teaching, teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your kingdom. One of us at your right and the other at your left. Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. Are you capable drinking the cup that I drink? Of being baptized into baptized, baptism? I'm about to be baptized with? Sure, they said. Why not? Jesus said, come to think of it, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized in my baptism. But as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. There are other arrangements for that. When the other ten heard of this conversation, they lost their tempers with James and John. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said. And when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It is not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. 
He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. I like photography. I like to take pictures. I like it so much that I went out and I bought myself a fancy camera. I meant to bring it in today. I, I meant to share with you this camera, but I forgot it. However, what I wanted to show you on that camera, I wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to see anyway. It's the technology of the camera. Because the technology of the camera allows me to take these wonderful, beautiful, fantastic pictures, better than my old camera could do. But there was a problem. You see, you've got to understand the technology in order to use it properly. And me and technology, we don't always get along. In the camera, when it's on direct focus mode, there's a little gray dot. And you have to put that little gray dot over the subject of what it is you want to take a picture, what you want to capture, what you want to bring into focus. I didn't always pay attention to where the little gray dot was. Consequently, if you're trying to take a picture of a flower or a bird or a squirrel or even sometimes people, I would come away with these absolutely fantastic, beautiful, wonderful pictures of twigs, bugs, leaves, walls, almost anything other than what I was trying to capture in the picture. Understanding the technology is important when you're using one of those fancy cameras. I have another camera I did bring with me. It's carry around in my pocket. It's called a cell phone. The neat thing about cell phones is they can take almost as good a picture as one of those fancy cameras, but it has something it can do that, well, my fancy camera can't. It can take selfies. That's where you turn the technology of the camera and the phone around so you can look at it and you see yourself and then you can snap a picture. I see people doing this all the time. There's some people out here who love to take selfies. They love to capture pictures of themselves and their friends. And that's cool. I'm not so much of a selfie guy. If I want to do it, I have to look into my camera and think about it and pay attention to get it done. Sometimes in faith, we can come at God from that same perspective. I call it selfie mode. Our faith's like taking a picture. It shows us or captures for us what we believe, what we hold dear, what we value. The problem is what we're focused on. In the story this morning, in James and John, we heard how they came to Jesus seeking a favor. Jesus, we want you to do something for us. They tell him, arrange it so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory, one at your right and one at your left. Jesus looks at him and says, you have no idea what you're asking. Then he asked him, can you drink the cup that I drink? Immediately, James and John demonstrate that they really don't understand Jesus at all because they say, sure, why not? Yeah, we can do that, whatever you say. Because John and James are focusing on what they want from Jesus, not on Jesus. I gotta be honest with you. My faith's a lot like that sometimes. Sometimes I go to God seeking what I can get God to do for me. Now, not always is it selfish. Sometimes what I want God to do is to heal somebody I love or to help somebody that I care about out of trouble. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not where it ends. 
that's not all that I do. Sometimes I really just want God to do something specifically just for me. The problem with that is, is that not everything that I want is right. Not everything that I want is good. Not everything that I want is always keeping with God's will and purpose. In order for me to really appreciate what God wants, I've got to make sure my little gray dot of faith is focused on God. And my little gray dot sometimes is focused on anything but God. It's focused on what I want, what I think, what I feel, what I fear. It can be focused on my politics and prejudices. It can be focused on my values rather than on God's will and purpose, God's kingdom. Listening to the story, we see that James and John want Jesus to give them the places of honor at the table. They're not much looking for a seat. They want to be one on the right, one on the left. They want to be in positions of influence, prestige, power. I see a lot of that going on in the world today. I see a lot of that going on in the church today. It bothers me. But it bothers me also because I can see it in myself. When I look at God, when I look at Jesus through the eyes of my values, my prejudices, my small-mindedness, it's like this camera in my phone. This is how big my God becomes. It's what I can fit into that frame. If you're on selfie mode, guess who's the center in that frame? Guess who's the biggest part of that picture? Yourself. And that's where my faith sometimes is with God. Jesus tries to explain this to the disciples when he says to them, look, it isn't that way with you. If you want to be first in the kingdom of God, you've got to be the servant. If you want to be first among yourselves, you now need to be a slave. In other words, you need to focus your attention not on what you want, but on what God wants. Because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Listen again to some verses from Isaiah 53. He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself that God was punishing for his, him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we got healed. We're all like sheep who have wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. On him. That's the cup. That's the cup Jesus drinks from. That's the cup of the kingdom. What's amazing about Jesus, whenever I read the stories of Jesus throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or go back into the Old Testament and read the prophecies about the Messiah, one thing always strikes me is that Jesus always put God's kingdom first. When you and I are trying to put our picture of faith together, the object of our faith should be Jesus. And the subject of our faith 
should be God's kingdom because that was the subject of Jesus' teachings, his ministry. Everything Jesus was about was about the kingdom and about how God wants to bring us all in to that kingdom. I read a book many, many years ago by J.B. Phillips called Your God is Too Small. Over the years that I have practiced in the ministry and tried to serve God and the kingdom of God in ministry, I found that my God, the God I was trying to present, was too small. I wanted my God to fit into this frame. I wanted my God to be small enough that I could control him. That's what J.B. Phillips is getting at in his book, that we want God to be small. Because a God that's big, we can't control. A God that's big enough to actually save us, actually do something for us, is a God we cannot control. But a God we cannot control is also a God who can control us. And that's where we have a problem. That's what James and John have a problem with. Because they want the positions of influence. They could see in Jesus the prestige, the power, the glory, the grandeur. Everything that made Jesus attractive. They could see that. But they couldn't see the sacrifice. They couldn't see the price that Jesus was willing to pay to bring all that about. To make all that worthwhile. Exactly what the prophet in Isaiah 53 is talking about. Yeah, we can see where Jesus ends up, but we have to go back and pay attention to how he got there, what he really was all about. Our choir director has a singing a hymn, an anthem rather, based on Psalm 27. In that Psalm, we're talking about seeing the face of God, seeking the face of God. In order to see the face of God, I believe we need to see the face of others. In fact, I don't believe any of us can really see the face of God or even really understand and appreciate Jesus if we're not looking at each other. And I'm not talking about the people right in our midst, the people we like, who are in our inner circle. I'm talking about the people that Jesus is looking to. I'm talking about the ones he died for. Jesus reached out to people who would have slapped away his hand. Jesus would have sought to save people who wouldn't have saved him. When I look at Jesus, what I'm beginning to see as I focus on Jesus, as I bring Jesus better into focus in my faith, is that Jesus spent more time trying to bring others to the table than where he was going to sit at that table. That's what makes Jesus different from James and John. I find it funny what James and John wanted because the truth of it is if they wanted to stay next to Jesus, the last thing they were going to do is sit down because Jesus is up moving around, always pulling out chairs so someone else can sit at the table of God the table of grace, the table of forgiveness, the table of salvation. Many times in the living of my life, I have focused on my own salvation and what it means to be right with God. But now that I'm older, I'm beginning to appreciate that Focusing on Jesus as the object of my faith means that I need to make the subject of my faith God's kingdom. And in doing that, salvation moves to the side. I don't focus on being saved. I focus on being righteous. And being righteous means having a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. To do that, I need to bring Jesus fully into focus, which means I need to fully appreciate and understand what Jesus was all about. Once I do that, 
Once I do that, salvation takes care of itself. I don't need to worry about being saved. God and grace will save me. If I'm focusing on Jesus and I'm focusing on getting God right in the living of my life, God's going to protect me. God's going to look after me. And I'm not going to be worried about where I'm sitting at the table because like Jesus, I'm probably going to be up trying to make sure other people have a place at that table. Those people aren't going to look like me. They're not going to think like me. They're not going to act like me. They're going to, need to have different politics. They're going to have different skin color. They're going to have different social values. They're going to have different economic values. They're going to be different from me as I am different from them. And as I'm indifferent or indifferent, excuse me, as I am different from Jesus. But grace makes the difference because grace covers that difference. And I then become all that God wants me to be because I'm focusing. My little gray dot isn't on myself. I'm not in selfie mode. My little gray dot isn't on what I want the kingdom to be. My little gray dot is squarely on and focused on Jesus and what Jesus is all about. Where's your little gray dot of faith today? What are you focusing on? Are you in selfie mode? Or have you turned the technology of your camera around and put it on a wide angle lens to take in all that God is seeking to do and all that the kingdom means. What are you focusing on today? Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we know through Jesus how much you care about us. You cared enough to take our sins on your back. You cared enough to make our wrongs your purpose, so that we might have a place at your table, that there may be room for us. But also, God, we recognize that making room for us calls us to make room for others. Don't look like us, don't act like us, don't think like us, don't have the same values, the same politics, or the same principles, and yet you call them. You want them just as much as you want us. That's your kingdom. When we get Jesus clearly into focus, we can see that. And when we see that, we can see why it's important. Therefore, God, guide our thoughts, guide our actions, guide our principles and values, not that we will be made, not that we will make you in our image, but that we will be made in your image, after your spirit, for the good of your kingdom, for Jesus' sake. For this we pray in his name. Amen.
May God bless you this day. May God embrace you and lift you up. May God bring the focus of your life into the focus of Jesus, that you may truly go in peace and live life in all its fullest. God bless. Thank mm -hmm. you.